Okay, so I'd like to start off by saying that you know a lot of the work that we've done over the years couldn't be accomplished without the support of various different groups, including um, the State of Hawaii Aquatic Resources Division, Forestry and Wildlife, um, NARS, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and um, funding sources like the National Science Foundation. And of course, the, the main work that was done um, over these years have been done by the graduate students in the lab. Mm -hmm. So without the graduate students, people like Dave Wee, Stephanie, Justin, um, uh, <coughs> Justin, and so on, um, it just couldn't have happened. So um, I just want to make sure that they got their proper acknowledgments right at the beginning. So today I'm going to be talking about the dimensions of diversity, uh, genetic groups relative to lineages in the Hawaiian anchorline, the Pia shrimp, Helicaridina rubra. And so when we start off by talking about these um, ecosystems in Hawaii, um, when you talk about the anchorline ecosystem in Hawaii, um, it, it needs some kind of polarization uh, to let people know what you're talking about. And so if you go across uh, some of these habitats in the Hawaiian Islands, what you might see is these landlocked pools of water that are fluctuating with the tides but have no direct connection to the sea. And having no direct con connection to the sea yet fluctuating with the oceanic tides suggests there's some kind of conductivity that's going on between the ocean and these um, ecosystems. And how you can tell that's really the case is because um, the, the waters in these habitats undergo anywhere from a brackish to hypersaline situation, um, two to 40 parts per thousand salt water uh, when you look at the connections uh, that are going on there. And the reason is, is that when you take a cross section of these habitats, is when you see why they are connected. So we have a um, hyper fresh water system um, that is coming down as typically fresh water um, that comes in as, as rain and percolates down to what we call the epigeal system. The epigeal system is that connection to the groundwater habitat that is above the surface, but not um, basically um, in darkness the whole time. Rather, um, you have that hypogeal, those, that epigeal system connected to a hypogeal system, which is that groundwater system that is underground and getting um, percolated water from the um, connection underlying or overlying um, that situation. Now, when you have this groundwater system coming in from the land, um, it's not disconnected from other sources, including the ocean. And so in this case, we have the ocean that is providing um, seawater, not only both to the surface, but to the subterranean um, ecosystem. And that as water moves out of this system and moves back in, um, it's basically pulling along epigeal, hypogeal, and oceanic water, not only connected to the terrestrial environment, but also the, um, the landlocked environment. And so you've got this, this very intricate <coughs> system of uh, water moving in and out of these ecosystems um, and coming in from a variety of different sources, including things like the, the rain and so on. Now, of these types of ecosystems, uh, or these habitats over the multiple different islands um, and, and terrestrial um, ecosystems across the world, 
Um, the Hawaiian Archipelago is where you find the highest uh, concentration of these types of habitats. So about of, of a thousand or so that are known worldwide, uh, about 700 plus are known from the Hawaiian Islands. And so we're right now on uh, Hawaii, but then uh, places like Maui and Oahu are also where you find uh, a number of these ecosystems. Um, the reason is, is that, you know, when you look at Maui and Oahu, even though they are older islands, um, they do have a lot of, of connectivity to the groundwater resources that are underground um, that you find in these types of habitats. And so it's not surprising that in spite of the fact that you know, Hawaii is a very small geographic landmass. It has the highest number of, of these types of habitats when you look at them across the world. Now, when you look at the Hawaiian ancholine habitats uh, in general across the islands, um, there is typically a molluscan, crustacean dominated uh, fauna that is typically found in these types of habitats. So anywhere from about three or so species of snails up to about five or six species of different shrimp that occur in these habitats, not only on Oahu, but then Maui and the Big Island. Now, of these different habitats across the islands and um, across the different habitats on an island, the most common species that you do find is what we call Halocarodina rubra. Um, that is the most common not only between but also within um, different habitats on the same island. And so when you look at Halocarodina rubra, which is one of the species that we've worked on, on in the lab over the last uh, 20 years, um, it is a very uh, interesting species from a variety of different standpoints. Um, it belongs to the family Atheidae. So Atheids are known as a family of shrimp. Instead of having pinchers as front appendages, they have CD, which they use to fan and sweep the substrate below them. And so um, these shrimp are constantly seen sweeping and feeding along the bottom uh, or glass of, of the habitat. And in spite of being small and phenotypically variable, for example, you know, here is um, a bunch of shrimp on, uh, in, a, in a ladle uh, right here on the can't bring it up. Um, so down in the lower left hand corner, what we see is that, you know, basically there is a bunch of shrimp that are fully adult, adult uh, individuals sitting inside of a ladle. And that in spite of the fact that they're hypogeal predominantly in existence, because you can dig a hole um, in many of these habitat uh, areas, and in spite of the fact that there are no shrimp there currently, the shrimp will come up and establish a population in a very short period of time. Um, we do have some evidence to suggest that their um, removal from the ancholine ecosystem can result in changes in the micro microbial community. Um, though um, how big those impacts are is variable. So basically we have these shrimp that are characterized by not only being um, the most common species within habitat, but also between these habitats on different islands. So when I first started this work back in 2003 or so, um, I looked at the literature and said, well, what, what would we expect to see? And 
given what we knew about the species at the time, it suggested that this um, species, Halocaridina rubra, um, was to have high colonization and dispersal uh, ability between Hawaiian ankyline environments for a variety of different reasons. For example, in spite of being a small invertebrate, um, Halocaridina has unusual longevity. Um, individuals have been kept alive by people I've talked to for at least 10 years. I've kept some alive going on 20. Some people have said, you know, up to 30 years. So when you have um, an individual shirt that can live up to 30 years, you would expect that, you know, basically they should be able to um, move from habitat to habitat pretty effectively. Along with that, um, those individual shrimp have a tolerance for extensive uh, salinity ranges anywhere from what we would consider fresh water, zero parts per thousand, up to hypersaline water at 50,000 per parts per thousand. Um, these shrimp produce larvae that are yolk-bearing or lysiotrophic and that those individuals take anywhere up to about a month to settle down. So you can imagine that if you had larvae that were out in the ocean for about a month, they could um, basically get from place to place fairly effectively. The reason that we, we felt that they could get from place to place pretty effectively was that their distribution is across most of the Hawaiian Islands, including Oahu, Maui, and the Big Island. And that on any of those islands, when you put a hole in the ground near the um, shoreline, you get um, shrimp showing up in a short period of time, suggesting that there's active migration through the groundwater system of an island. So when you add all of these things up where the larvae are getting from place to place, the adults are able to tolerate a variety of different um, habitat conditions. The larvae and the babies are able to also survive a variety of different conditions. Um, we felt that there was gonna be a lot of mixture from island to island, place to place, given what we knew what was going on. So to test this, um, back in 20,000, 20, yeah, about 20,002, 20,003, so about 30 years ago, um, we started collecting animals uh, of Halocaridina rubra from different places on different islands and asking the very simple question of what's the phylogeographic structure of Halocaridina rubra in the Hawaiian Islands. And so um, the two big, biggest places where samples could be acquired from was Oahu and um, the big island, Maui to a lesser extent, the other islands is kind of hit and miss, um, but we gathered anywhere from six to about 30 individuals per population. And um, what we did was we used uh, genetic sequences of the cytochrome oxidase um, subunit one um, mitochondrial um, sequence to, to basically start getting a feel for what was going on across the islands. Now on top of that, um, not only did we, de did we do sampling in Hawaii, but we also sampled places like East Timor and Okinawa where we were able to get closely related species but distinct enough that they belong to different genera or different um, 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 species and units so that we could feel and, and get a feel for you know what was going on in Hawaii relative to these other places.
So what did we find? Well, we hypothesized that there would be a lot of mixture across the different Hawaiian islands just because of everything that we knew that was going on with the species. And, you know, of course, you start off with a hypothesis and then you find out you're dead wrong. <laughs> And so what we found was that instead of having a single species that spanned multiple islands or different parts of an island, what we found was that we had um, what appeared to be potentially different species spanning very distinct parts of an island and very localized in a particular context. For example, um, on the Big Island of Hawaii, in this case, what we had was, um, you know, basically, let's see. Uh, so what we had here on the, the Big Island was, for example, um, what was found as the color red as a particular what we call lineage was all located on the eastern side of the island while uh, we had a distinct different lineage represented by blue on the western side of the island and you see the same thing happening on maui as well as oahu where instead of having um, what appeared to be one species representing um, multiple units on one island, uh, what we had was basically a species that represented unique lineages on each of the different islands. So what we had here was instead of um, one species representing multiple islands, we had what could be considered up to eight different species, um, you know, localized to the Hawaiian Islands. And the reason that we said that this was the case was that, uh, can people see it? Yeah. Okay. So what we see here is that, you know, we have these different colored lineages that are basically confined to different parts of each island. And um, what we became really apparent of what was going on uh, right at the start was that these different um, lineages were confined to each part of an island based on what we would call the rift zones that occurred on each of these islands. So for example, here, when you look at the big island, um, you have these rift zones that come off of Kilauea volcano, and um, basically those different uh, rift zones represented here by dotted lines um, act as these, um, these conf confined areas where these different lineages get, get trapped. So what we have is, you know, basically a situation where we've got these eight different lineages um, that are occurring because of different um, <coughs> ecological um, situations where these animals get trapped into these different habitats. Now, not only do we see that these animals um, get trapped and diverge from each other within um, isolation, but when we start bringing them back together, we start seeing that they're not, um, they're not well, um, connected anymore when it comes to the genetic relatedness. For example, um, here you have these two different lineages uh, represented by B and C here. The animals in some of these are much redder, um, while animals are in these other closely related lineages are much more um, opaque. 
Um, and what we see is that in spite of the fact that these are still related to each other in the big scheme of things, uh, when it comes to their genetic relatedness, um, they have diverged to a point where um, phenotypic variation is reflected in their uh, genetic uh, variation. And not only do you see that when it comes to um, just things like the, the coloration of their bodies, um, which you can see here is very well separated from different lineage to lineage, but also in the fact of things like the, the number of larvae that are produced per um, different, different group per year, or um, the um, differences that you find across different months. What you find is that these shrimp are genetically differentiated from each other um, when it comes from um, break to break. And what it comes down to is their genetics. Um, you know, they're basically their genetics, not only in the sense of the geography isolating them from place to place, but their genetics in the sense that in spite of being a small invertebrate, they produce larvae that are quite large that take a lot of resources to get isol uh, to become isolated and to diverge from each other when it comes to being from um, different geologic resources. And so what you have is that these larvae are large individual shrimp, but they produce um, very small um, 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 gill tissues, and those gills is what basically prevents them from being able to um, move from habitat to habitat when it comes to um, what's going on from a day-to-day -day basis. So basically, what becomes uh, the situation is that these larvae are trapped not only within the geologic uh, resource of the island that they're born on, but also within the, 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 the habitats that they are produced in. So basically it becomes um, a very isolating event. And the reason that we know this is that when you take these animals and you measure things like egg size, um, which is something that we can measure fairly easily in the lab, uh, especially given that there's been a lot of work with uh, closely related um, atheids like um, Caradino uh, instinctia up in Australia, what you see is that as egg size becomes bigger and bigger, a lot of the population parameters that you see for these different ecological groups becomes higher. Which means is that, is that as these larvae get produced, um, when they become larger, they basically become more isolated from each other, from different populations, because of what's going on based on their body size um, when they get reproduced. And so in spite of the fact that you know, an individual female shrimp like Halocaridina right here will produce uh, multiple different eggs, those eggs are very large and very um, large when it comes to the, the larval size that gets produced when those individuals get hatched. And so when you put those two things together, what happens is, is that in spite of the fact of these large egg sizes um, being produced by these individuals um, producing larvae that are uh, 
on the larger end of being extinct, um, of distinctive from each other, is that even if they are not already distinctive from each other, they get closer to uh, what you would expect as the, the larger um, divergence than what you would normally see. And so, when we first saw this, we thought, well, maybe it's something just because of Haloperidina rubra. Uh, maybe if we looked at other species um, that occur in Hawaiian ankyline environments, they might be um, more representative. One of the close species that we looked at was Metabateus lohenna, which is um, a um, planktonotrophic larval producer. So in this case, a set of larvae that are uh, producing their own eggs and yolk. Um, these animals, the females produce larvae that are basically able to eat food as they're moving through the planktonic system. And so when we looked at those individuals from um, different islands on Oahu, Maui, as well as the Big Island, what we see is that overall there was almost no difference that was going on between these different islands, suggesting that the isolation that we were seeing for um, Haloperidina was more or less specific to that species and not because of the ecological context that it occurred in. So, when we look at these, um, these networks where you've got these different groups of shrimp that are representing different mitochondrial lineages, each of which have their own um, number of unique haplotypes, and those haplotypes are distinctive from each other to the point where you can separate them out by different colors. In this case, where what we thought was uh, one thing could be broken up into multiple different things, what we can do is we can come up with a um, network analysis where we look at the um, range of variability between these different um, groups. So the question is, what does blue represent to red and red to green and so on? And so what we could see is that we had this tri- um, Try mecca of different diversities. And in the case of, okay, what was um, the, the diversity that we saw between different species on, or different genera on the same island was about 21% um, compared to about 5% when you compared what was being compared within a color to the different colors on the same island versus what you would see um, when you compared um, different haplotypes within a color to um, you know haplotypes within the same color. So what we get is this this try um, this this try. Uh, distinctive distribution in the question of who or what do these things dif different represent. And what this suggested to us when we started doing this work back in 2009, uh, 2010, when we published it, was that what we had was instead of one species across multiple islands, we had each of these different lineages representing a distinct species, um, each of which was found on a specific island. And the reason was pretty straightforward when we came to a proposed model of the, you know, evolutionary diversification. 
in the sense that in this case, if we take the overall data and we say here is what's going on from island to island, if we've got here two different examples of an island, island one versus island two, each of these represents a four, um, a four um, island situation where you've got aquifers that are representing three to four different aquifers on the each island. When you've got one or two islands, what happens is that in many cases, um, what you have on one island, larvae get distributed out into the ocean, but oftentimes those larvae, when they get out into the ocean, they almost 100% of the time never succeed in getting established at, on a new island. And so given the fact that they are pretty well um, isolated from each other because they never 100% um, exceed or, or um, you know, basically get um, a, a habitat um, advantage, um, what you get is overall um, a situation where you get literally um, no successful colonization and establishment from island to island um, almost 100% of the time. It's so basically those larvae are getting distributed out into the ocean, but because once they get out to the ocean, there's almost no success on, on any uh, productivity, they get lost. Now, sometimes when animals get distributed out into the ocean, they do successfully get from an island to a distinct island, which is something that we don't see very often. But when we do, um, even though they get successfully uh, isolated to a new island, that leads to their disconnection from not only the parental population that they start off from, but also the population that they um, establish from. <coughs> and so basically you get these animals that are, are again now isolated from each other over time. And so what you get is this again disconnect between different islands uh, given what's going on with the different populations. Now, if you do successfully get established from island to island, um, sometimes what can happen is that once you get established on an island, you get to a physiological or ecological break between different parts of an island. And sometimes while animals might make or might be able to make um, that move around the edge of the island. There's no guarantee, but in, in case that they do, they do get established. But once they get established there on a different island, they get um, basically disconnected from their same per original parental populations on the same island. And we see that happening on different places on Oahu. Now, while you've got these other populations that could be established on one island versus islands, um, other islands that are happening, one of the big things that can happen is what we call these genetic groups. And this is one thing that I've run into over the years where I've talked to people uh, multiple times, is that while we have eight different lineages that represent these different genetic and or potential um, species within Halocaridana rubra, we have these things that we call genetic groups. And how we define these genetic groups 
are these situations where you've got these two um, clusters of genetic relatedness that while they occur um, in closely related spatial situations to each other, they are not necessarily um, the same genetic en entity anymore. So in this case, you can see that these entities are moving away from each other, and eventually, because they're trapped in different aquifers, um, they'll become distinct lineages down the road. And the reason that this is important is because um, when you connect what we know going on the ground versus um, what's leading to the different uh, isolation groups, you get these situations where you're trying to explain what's happening here. For example, here we have the island of Oahu. And Oahu, while it has one, two, three, four different lineages, each represented by a different color, this, this purple color, the blue color, the orange color, and the brown color, there's actually multiple geographic or genetic groups that are involved within this diversification. For example, Kalialoa versus Waianae versus Kahuku versus Lanikai. So you can see that in places like the Windward Oahu lineages, you have these two genetic groups versus you know, what looks like to be one thing is actually two or more things um, there. And so there's a lot more <clears throat> geographic and um, genetic diversity that's, a, that's unknown um, that you don't see when you start just concentrating on these different genetic groups. So for example, here is what we have uh, when we look at Oahu, where we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have different, eight different genetic groups, or in this case, um, lineages that are diverse from each other when it comes to um, different parts of the, the islands that we've looked at, Maui, Oahu, and Big Island. But when, instead of looking at the lineages, which are um, the eight different um, groups that we see in Halocaridina, if we look at the genetic groups, instead of eight, we've got actually close to 15. So here we got seven, eight, nine, and then uh, add on another six. So we've got 15 different genetic groups that represent um, isolated and diverging lineages from each other relative to what we know as the different geographic groups on these different islands. And oftentimes, what we see is that these are occurring near the boundaries of volcanoes. And so here we have the island of Oahu, where we've got these different lineages um, or different geographic groups that are occurring on the uh, south eastern side of uh, southwestern side of the, the big island of Oahu where we've got these different lineages and what we can see is that in spite of the fact that we've got um, at least four different groups in case of here these four different groups are at least separated from each other in by three or more so geographic regions um, where what you find in a region like the EBA genetic group
is isolated from each other because of these, these different um, hydrological barriers that occur under the islands. And you don't only see this on Oahu, but you see it particularly on the Big Island. So on the Big Island, especially near um, the, the south uh, eastern part of the island, um, where you start looking at a lot of these um, geologic barriers that come off Kilauea's volcano. Um, many of these different populations um, occur because of these different isolating um, barriers, particularly because of the groundwater, um, where you've got this Haloperidina genetic groups that occur um, very distinctly between these different areas. So in summary, uh, for Haloperidina as a shrimp species, what we see is that island geography and ocean, along with their life history, are strong barriers to dispersal. And this accumulates and occurs particularly during ecological and evolutionary time scales. Now, um, when the animals escape these ecological and evolutionary time scales, you get into situations where the lineages of Hiloparadina, um, these different colors that we saw earlier, are the end products of divergence in, in isolation. And so when you start looking at these uh, situations where they're occurring in divergence in isolation, it's typically that these genetic groups, um, which is a shallower level of genetic diversity, but still leading along this continuum of, 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 of isolation, is that um, they're relatively early during the um, diversification process, but again, they're happening along this, this continuum. And what it brings up is this very interesting situation when it comes to conservation and management. So from Haloparadina's um, aspect, we often ask ourselves, well, how do we protect these species? Do we look at them from a lineage or these different genetic groups? Now, remember, lineages, we saw that there was about eight of them. For genetic groups, there was about 15 of them. But in either case, how do you, do you protect 15 or 8 when it comes to um, Haloparadine or rubra? Well, in this case, um, it adds a whole different layer of, of continuity because you can ask yourself the same way with Haloparadine um, as well as for other species. Do you adapt habitat or organismal strategies in Hawaii and elsewhere for protecting these kinds of resources? Um, the question is, is that do you protect one or more lineages or genetic groups of Haloparadina versus other one? Or um, do you try to protect um, the species as a whole? And so in this case, it becomes a lot harder to, to really decide how best to handle um, these isolation type situations. Because in spite of the fact that you've got these different genetic groups and lineages of Haloparadina, um, they're at two plus levels of, of diversity. Um, versus what you see going on there. So lots of questions that you have to think about in that kind of case. But with that, I am going to um, be done and I open up the floor to any questions that might come up. population that's in a while but we've really been diverging enough from the ones that the um, lineage that's on the 
on the Big Island that you can rule out completely the possibility of introduction, not just by modern humans, but you know, these Polynesians were using Opaiula as bait. Yeah, we, we've been able to do that in the sense that we've tried to um, identify, you know, if there was historic transmission of larvae from one island to the next, or you know, animals from one island to the next, and establishment, and we haven't been able to to show that that's the case. Um, and the reason is, is that, again, like you said, um, if there was transmission that occurred, um, trying to get, uh, trying to get evidence of, of good historic records is almost impossible. Um, <clears throat> knock on wood, so far we haven't been able to show any of that going on from island to island. Do you have, um, have you been able to sample or what are your thoughts on how to care a dining hall to get home? So um, with Paul Hemmel, um, there hasn't been any real good um, <clears throat> genetic material that has been able to be isolated to show, um, you know, what's Paul Hemmel compared to what we know as Haloperidina. Um, that includes, you know, um, museum specimens, that includes other specimens. Um, knock on wood, the genetic evidence that we've been able to accumulate to date suggests that Paula Hemmel and Rubra are, are part of the same species complex in the big scheme of things. There's, within any of these species, um, Haloperidina, particularly, what you find within a group is both as variable molecularly as well as genetically between different groups. And so there hasn't been really great evidence to suggest that, you know, what, <coughs> what these different groups represent are distinct lineages when it comes to genetic evidence. Do you see any evidence of like population um, genetic bottlenecks and like maybe a lot of population might be threatened because it's so small? Or? We, we've seen some of that. Um, the biggest, the actual biggest um, evidence for genetic bottlenecks that we've seen are on the Big Island populations, uh, particularly near Pohuiki, which we've known you know, has gone through very big seismic activities over short periods of time since the 1960s. Um, we've got funding right now to try to look at some of these populations, but because things are so variable, when it gets down to you know going and collecting samples at these different locations during a different time, it just becomes a, a coin toss where it's like, oh, today I was able to get 20 samples, and tomorrow I won't be able to find anything, you know, kind of thing. <coughs> so. Um, kind of a two-part question. So from the perspective of a shrimp, what does this boundary between rift zones look like? Like is it that the water is discontinuous or that the rock becomes impermeable as a barrier? And thus, do you think that it's more likely when they move between zones that they went underground or that they dispersed oceanically to a different part of the island? So when you get to these different edges between the rift zones, um, that's a great question. What does the shrimp see? 
Um, from what we've been able to look at from the hydrological, geological evidence is that water on one side does not mix with water on the other side. Now, how does that look like? Well, that suggests that there's a barrier there that is impenetrable to um, mixing on either side. Um, how that evolves over time and space is a big question. Um, when I started getting into some of this stuff, um, it was one of these questions that I had myself on exactly what was going on from a geologic standpoint. And from what we can tell is that, you know, these are watertight, airtight compartments. Um, you know, what's happening in one is isolated from what's happening in the, the adjacent one. And it's because of, you know, what's trapped on left or right of that boundary. Now, what does that exactly look like? It depends on the chemistry of the different um, habitats, you know, what's happening between different islands, different compartments of an island <coughs> at that time. Can you make these things in the lab? And if so, do you get better success within a lineage than between lineages? So that's, yeah, well, while we can get Halocaridina to, to routinely, I guess, um, more or less routinely um, reproduce in the lab, it's not as straightforward as Drosophila, where you know you put X or Y into a vial and you get Z. Um, and the reason is that X and Y, you know, how you identify an individual male or female, there takes some art to be able to do it. And it's you know, not as straightforward as, oh, that's male, that's a female, just chuck them in to a container. Um, so there is a little bit of, of difficulty there. Now, once you got those individuals that are in a container, um, it usually takes about six to eight individuals to get an established colony started. And what I mean by this case is that while you can't sex an individual and say male or female and put those into a container, um, if you randomly take six to eight individuals, you will get about a 50-50 split between male and female. So you can basically start a colony from a minimal of less than 10 individuals just because of the, the I guess, the um, roll of the dice when it comes to like, oh, yeah, you know, these, you've got 10 individuals, five of them are going to be male, five of them are going to be female. Um, once you got a colony that starts, um, you've got you've got the, uh, the potential to have an endless supply of shrimp, but it's getting the colony to start off to begin with, and oftentimes you need to have it. You know, and this is not voodoo science, but it's it's one of these when the animals are in a <coughs> window that is facing the east level of a building, they reproduce because of light coming in and so on. And so when you add all those things together, um, it is straightforward to set something up. It's a little bit more of a gamble when it comes to do I get reproductive output from it in the long run. There's 
some probably low potential for uh, human assisted mixing of lineages. Um, what might come from that? So that that's one thing that we haven't seen till you know up until right now, in the sense that there hasn't been any data to suggest that anything that we've seen out in the wild is because of relatively recent or more modern human intervention. Now, in spite of the fact that Haloperidina does go for a premium um, in the Western, um, um, I guess, ecological animal context, and what I mean by a premium is that you can go online and there are people who sell Haloperidina rubra for $40, $50 a shrimp. You know, and when you take things like Brookstone, which used to sell the uh, Ecospheres for 30 bucks a pop, where there was three or four shrimp in it, and then you break that down, where they come out to be like 20 bucks a shrimp. Um, those days have kind of disappeared, but if you go on to, um, you know, eBay or such, you'll find you know, 50, 40, 50 dollar animals uh, going for a, a, regular, a regular show. Um, in spite of the fact that people have still spent significant amounts of money, um, there isn't any evidence out there to suggest that any of either historic or current um, use of animals, like in opelu fishing and so on like that, has led to establishment of populations outside of what you expect them to be. There's just, there isn't, hasn't been anything like that that we've seen. So yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I've I've gone toward <coughs> referring to this whole complex as halo paradigm, um, just because we're getting to a point that probably in the next ten years, you know, by the time I'm ready to retire, we'll probably name these different species uh, or these different groups as distinct species at the very least based on their ecology. And the reason is, is that in spite of the fact that, you know, it doesn't matter if this shrimp is in this aquifer and these shrimp are in this aquifer, the fact that they don't see each other ecologically means that they'll never see each other in the big scheme of things. So they might as well be different species because they're ecologically isolated. And that's what we see happening across multiple islands. So over, over time, what we'll probably have is that, um, you know, there'll be an acceptance or people will feel that, okay, this is no longer a species complex. And the reason is because they're ecologically isolated from each other given space and time. Um, what, does, what does that look like when it comes to the naming convention? It'll all depend on what the naming convention is during that, that period of, of time when we do it. But you know, at this point, yeah, Haloperidina is more or less a distinctive group across the Hawaiian Islands. And a lot of it just comes down to their basic biology. 